Hi all, thank you for coming. Probably like my favorite entrance this weekend or ever. That was, that was great. How's your day been so far? Well, the worst part of the day was walking into room A that I've been told to go to to find it totally empty. I thought, oh my God, it's time to retire. <laughs> Well, we're all here. We were waiting for you. So uh, thank you so much for joining us here this weekend. Glad to. Awesome. So uh, I, I kind of wanted to start by talking because I've seen a bunch of people walking around the convention actually with with your book, Sons of yes, Soul. Yes, my book. Yeah. So what what has that been like for you, and, and how thrilling has it been seeing such a positive reaction? Uh, it's been terrific. I um about ten years ago, um, I'm a huge fan of sci-fi and comedy. And uh, I thought I'd really like to write uh, a, a comedy sci-fi book. And uh, I, you know, I'd written for television uh, and, and uh, a little bit for film. Um, but of course, when you write that way, you're just writing dialogue, and you know all the action and the settings will be provided by costume uh, costumiers, uh, designers, and uh, other actors. And I sat down to write this book, and I realized, oh my God, I've got to do everything. You know, I've got to set the scene, I've got to, you know, and, and I'm, I'm talking about a lot of it happening in space, so I've got to describe space the way it really is, and space travel. But I had an absolute ball doing it, and then I got really busy, and um, a guy said he was going to publish it, he didn't, and, he, and so it went, on, it went on for years, actually. And then last year, I was working with a really nice guy as a producer, and uh, we, were, we were having a drink after work one day, and he said, he said, oh, so, you know, what's your, big, I was like, what's your biggest regret? And I said, well, I never got my book published. And he went, well, I published a book, send it to me. And it was in Amazon, it was on Amazon within, in like two months, you know. Wow. So, you know, you finally meet somebody that actually says they can do something and they do it. So I've been thrilled that people have got to see it and read it. And uh, there's some very interesting things have happened around it. I did a little tour early in the year of, um, Conventions and I went, and I'm not being rude because I am Irish myself, but I went to Dublin and I went to Budapest. I sold four books in Dublin and 26 in Budapest, which I think says a lot about uh, my fellow Irishman's reading habits. <laughs> um, you said it. Huh? Yeah, I said it. I can say it because I'm Irish. Fair. Okay. I was going to say that's so serendipitous, though, isn't it? Like meeting the right person that yeah, can work out. Yeah, exactly, there. exactly. And uh, you know, and this happens, and of course, you know, I think you're not know, all sort of. You know, entertainment and uh, the industry, so much of it does rely upon those fortuitous meetings, or not, as the case may be. So, uh, if any of you want to come to my table, I have a few books left. Very, very inexpensive, nicely signed, beautifully written. And if you don't understand, if you don't laugh four times during the reading of the book, you, you can bring it back to me and I'll give you half price back. <laughs> next year. <laughs> what a deal. Yeah. I love it. Uh, let's also uh, talk a little bit about Musketeer, because I know that was a recent release as well. At, was it at the LA Shorts? It was, yeah. Um, it, it, an interesting thing has happened during uh, COVID um, in, in the way in which people sell ideas for movies. And this is a, a movie idea. But nowadays it isn't, you know, that people aren't doing personal meetings and um, it's not enough to send a script. So what a lot of people have been doing, and what this guy, Phil Shaw, did, he had this movie idea for the, the Musketeers when they're very old. Couldn't imagine what he was getting in touch with me for, but um, apparently I'm very old. So um, what, what people do now is they'll write a little short, maybe take a bit of the film that's self-contained, and make it, we made it one day, um, and I was playing the old Musketeer, um, you know, coming near the end of his life and having to do another sort of sword fight with some people who were trying to rob him. And um, it worked out really well, and um, I, I've even won a couple of accolades for my acting, which is strange, because I thought I was always quite rubbish, but <laughs> apparently, apparently they liked it, and it's been at a lot of festivals. So I think with that sort of interest, hopefully, we might, you know, in the coming couple of years, make a feature film of it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it'd be nice. So, okay, so we talked about writing, we talked about obviously you being in the LA Short. Can you tell us a little, about, uh, a little bit about like venturing into directing as well? Because I know you also directed, was it Lipstick? Lipstick, yes. Um, I, yeah, one of the first things that happened during uh, uh, lockdown was, uh, you know, two years ago, was that I thought, well, either this is going to be a disaster or I can see there's an opportunity. And, so, I, you know, I did a lot of voice work. Um, I, I traveled with them, some equipment that I can record on. 
And, uh, and also I decided I was going to direct a film. And actually a guy who runs this place where uh, this little acting school said, well, I've got this film and you could direct it in class. And I said, no, let's go out, let's raise a little bit of money, let's get some good equipment and let's go and actually shoot the thing as a, as a film. And it's done very well. It's been in about 30 festivals. And, uh, so, and, and it really, really piqued my interest in directing some more. Was that like the first time that you realized that was something you were passionate about? Or have you always been passionate about writing and directing? No, uh, not at all actually, but I, it's a bit rude of me to say this, but I guess I've come across so many terrible directors in my time. I figured that if I had a chance to do it, I, I, I would at least know what I wanted and, and when I got it, which I think are the two big things about directors. You work with a lot of directors who aren't really sure what they want, so they make you do it over and over and over again. And then really they leave it to the editor to, to make the film and um, it's exhausting for the actors and it, it, you know, it takes all the fun out of it and all the spontaneity out of it. So I, I, you know, I like to get my actors very well prepared um, and uh, really uh, say to them, I'm, you know, I'm going to give you a couple of takes, so whatever you do is going to be in the movie, so it's up to you to prepare really. Um, I, I was been reading a bit about Clint Eastwood actually as a director. Um, I worked with the late um, Richard Harris many years ago, just after he'd made Unforgiven, <clears throat> and he described um, Mr. Eastwood's process uh, in great detail, and I, and I thought that's the way I would like to work. And in fact, just as I'd finished making Lipstick, I heard a story from somebody else about uh, uh, Matt Damon um, doing a film with him, I think it was Invictus, and um, uh, he did two takes, and, and Clint said, okay, let's move on. And um, Matt said, can I do another take? And he went, why would you want to waste everybody's time? And they moved on. And Clint said, you move on, you move on. Okay. And also, not a bad Clint Eastwood impression. Well, I, I, I do, do, do we have any minors in the house? Any children? Because there's a story I want to tell, but I can only tell it to adults. Okay, let's go. No, we're good. Um, the reason that I do a Clint Eastwood is that I had a friend many years ago called Tony Stevens who did a film called Space Cowboys, and he played Clint Eastwood as a young man. He, and he's English, <coughs> believe it or not. And so he thought, I, I can't believe I'm playing Clint Eastwood as a young man. So he went to Clint one day and said, can I just have a quick word with you? Have you got any advice on how to play Clint Eastwood? And he said, he said yeah, it's all in the subtext. He said, subtext? Cowboy and a, and a cop. What do you mean the subtext? And he said, "Well, when you play me, whatever you do, whatever you say, just think, fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> you watch his films, man. You will never get over it. It's like every line his eyes is kind of like. Yeah. yeah it's good. <laughs> Uh, okay, so just to pivot a little bit, uh, I know that you do have the opportunity to go to a lot of, you know, these conventions and you get to meet a lot of people. I see that you're doing one on a boat later this year, I believe. No, it's, it's sank. It, oh. Yeah, so no. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess my uh, follow-up question, regardless, is how are your sea legs? Oh, my sea legs are <clears throat> terrible. Um, one of the things I found out, though, <clears throat> doing pirates, and before Pirates, I did a thing in the Arctic about, um, about the deal fated um, Shackleton expedition in, in 1912 to the, to the Antarctic, trying to get to the South Pole. And I discovered that I had terrible sea lakes and suffered really bad with seasickness, but also that I'm very, very lucky that I don't get uh, a drowsy on Dramamine, because a lot of actors can't take it because they just doze off halfway through the scene, you know, because it's a sort of a sedative or a, I can't remember what sort of drug it is, but I can, I can eat those things, you know. I think my capacity for taking pills probably comes from growing up in the 70s, but we won't go into that. Um, that was my next question, but yeah, exactly. it's okay. So, um, so, yeah, so I can shovel the Dramamine down, and, and, you know, while people are swimming in their own vomit around the, um, 
on the surface of the deck. Um, I'll be there, you know, bouncing around saying, I'll take his line, that's great. I feel like that's like your superhero ability. You it is, yeah. Drag me yeah. Without getting Don't to keep my to keep my cookies down at sea. Very important, especially for some of the films you make. Yeah. Uh, and I saw you were also inducted into the National Pirates Hall of Fame. I was. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Of course. Yes, uh, and um, it was it was a great honor to be inducted in. Um, you, you know the prize that they sent me? I don't. No. One of the ugliest statues I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually terrible. And it got broken on the way over on the plane. So, um, uh, but it, it was great to be part of that. And um, I, 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 I keep meaning to find out who the others are. Yeah, I think I mean, we, we need to find out. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's only a finite amount of people in Pirates of the Caribbean, so I don't know who all these other people are, but we'll find out, I guess. I'm sure we can Google it. So what yeah. was the statue of? A pirate. <laughs> Just like a really ugly pirate? Really ugly pirate, yeah, on a huge plinth. Oh. I, yeah. I feel like we need, like, a redesign. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk to them about I that. I think we should. After we figure out who else is in it, yeah. we'll, we'll, get, we'll get them on the line. Um, okay, and <laughs> another thing I wanted to ask about is obviously your role on The Crown, and I wanted to know what kind of research did you have to do in order to play your role on uh, Bernard? Well, it was a very small part, actually, on The Crown, and the only reason I did it was A, to, to work with Gillian Anderson, who I think is a wonderful actress, and she was playing Mrs. Thatcher. But the, also the reason I did it is I remember in the 80s this man, Sir Bernard Ingham, and he had an extraordinary accent and an extraordinary vo voice and a very strange, oh, I'm glad I got that story in earlier, and a very, a very odd demeanor. And I just knew I had him, you know, I just knew I had him in me. So I was very pleased to play it. I was in about three episodes. I probably had a couple of scenes in each, in each episode. Um, but I didn't know how to play him. I had his voice right down, so it was really good. So, that. Yeah. And obviously, like you mentioned, uh, Margaret Thatcher, and I mean, she went on to win, what, multiple, multiple awards for her role on The Crown as well. Yeah, she did. It's, I've done two things about Margaret Thatcher now. One was with um, uh, Liz Duncan and, and this one with uh, Gillian Anderson. They always cast somebody very beautiful to play Mrs. Thatcher. And I thought she had a bit of a hatchet face myself. <laughs> in, in, in my humble opinion, excuse me. So what was better, her face or the statue? Um, oh no, the statue wins hands down. I think. <laughs> we needed to just clear that up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and another thing before we get to questions from y'all is obviously uh, being being British. I'm assuming. Can I just stop you a second? Yes. I've got exactly the same boots as you're wearing. Really? Did Do you, you really? get them in Shire? I don't know where I got these on on uh, like Poshmark or something. Oh, they're exactly the same. It's extraordinary. Okay, we'll have to coordinate. The Sorry to carry on. No, it's okay. Can you okay. send me pictures of what you're going to wear? So, I mean, we could have had a, an absolute disaster. I, we would have same. clashed. Would you have worn the fringe jacket too? Yeah. Okay. I certainly would. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to know, obviously, like getting to be part of Doctor Who, uh, is being a Whovian in your blood? Yes, uh, and, I, and I know why it's in my blood as well, because when I was a young lad, while my mum was making tea at six o'clock on a Saturday night, I would be shuffled into the living room where I would sit down and watch a program called the Telly Goons, kids' program at tea time at six o'clock. Um, because I was very young, I didn't really <coughs> listen to the announcers afterwards, and I didn't realize one week that the telly goons had finished. <coughs> and I, so mum went to the kitchen, and I went into the living room, and I sat down waiting for my favorite television program, the telly goons. And the man said, and now at the beginning of a new series, we presented Doctor Who, and I went screaming to the kitchen, going, Mom, Mom, the telly goons are now, there's a stupid doctor on them, and a thing about the hospitals. And um, anyway, so she said, well, it doesn't matter. Can I have a look, see what it's like? <clears throat> of course, 40 minutes later, I was the first and the largest Doctor Who fan on the planet um, and watched it all through the 60s and through the 70s. And then I was first in it in the 80s. And so and what was marvelous about being in it this time is that I was interviewed about my 1980s experience in the very first Colin Baker, um, uh, Doctor Who, called The Twin Dilemma. And the guy met me in a coffee shop and he was, he was sort of vaguely nervous, I thought. I'd have to put him at his ease. And I said, before, um, <coughs> before we go on, I want you to know that I am fully aware that The Twin Dilemma is largely regarded 
as the worst episode of Doctor Who ever made. And he went, oh, thank God for that. And he said, I thought I was going to have to break it too. So I sent this to Jody when I worked with her last year, and she went, oh, great, fantastic track record. Thank you very much. But fortunately, the reception of the multi-episode series Flux, and in particular of my character, Eustatius Jericho, uh, was, was very warm and welcoming. And so I was, I was glad to get back and, and right a wrong that I'd committed in the 80s by being in such a crap show. <laughs> yeah, when I saw that announcement, I was like so excited. And I mean, that's just so great. And I'm so happy for you. Thanks. So, of course. So, uh, okay, we're gonna throw it to y'all. Uh, whatever questions you guys may have, we just ask that you project so we can hear you from the audience. Any willing victims that want to ask a question? We'll start over here. Who? <laughs> Of course, working with Johnny Depp is fantastic. And, you know, I made five films with him, and um, he's one of the loveliest men you will ever meet, and one of the um, one of the nicest men to work with, one of the greatest colleagues you could ever have. I, I will say this: he hasn't got a very big grasp on punctuality. <laughs> um, in fact, I used to amuse uh, Javier Bardem on the last one by. Um, Whenever I was fully made up and fully in costume, I would leap out of the makeup truck and say, I'm ready, can you wake up Johnny? <laughs> and, uh, he, he went to, I can't believe how late that guy was. <laughs> but he, had, no, he hasn't got much of a grasp of punctuality. I mean, he, he, he smiles at you like a nine-year-old and then you, you can't help liking him, you know what I mean? Forgiving him. You girls know what I mean. <laughs> Some of the fellas by the look of it. I think there's somebody. Are you putting your hand up back there? No, I'm just agreeing to you. No one's sitting right there. Second, now, do you ever listen to the Hollywood Vampires, his band? Uh, not, I haven't seen them live, but of course I've, I've watched a number of YouTubes. Because uh, you know, Johnny is um, his first love is music. He never wanted to be an actor, he became an actor totally by accident. Um, and music is in his blood. He loves it, yeah. Is there any scene in particular, because obviously, like you said, you did five films with him. Any scene in particular that maybe it was just the day when you guys just couldn't get through a scene because you were just having the best time, laughing, enjoying the moment? Well, we did a lot of that, but we both professionals and we've always um, got what we know. Um, we've always, we always got through every scene with great, uh, with great ease. My particular favorite um, scene uh, is, the, is the end of the Four, when we we walk off down a Hawaiian beach together like a like an old married couple, I think it's really sweet. <laughs> All right, who's next? Come on, guys. Whatever questions you may have, clearly nothing's off limits. All right, you in the don't, don't force them to ask a question. As soon as I'm finished here, I'm going for a drink, so okay, yeah. we can finish anytime you like. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, since you just mentioned that, I'm wondering, is, was there a real rum in the bottles? It's Disney. <laughs> <laughs> There is, in fact, the only safe haven for having a drink on the set of Pirates of the Caribbean was in Johnny's trailer itself. <laughs> and about um, five o'clock most evenings, he'd say, um, uh, say hey, Ken, I think, I think we'd better go and talk about the scene. And I, I'd go, well, oh, yes, he is, I'll be right there. <laughs> great. And he had a lovely wine selection in his, um, in his trailer, which was great. Yum. Did, did, okay, we'll go then. How did I get into it? Um, uh, I, I, I hope there's nobody here who's heard this story before, because I tell this all the time. When I was a young boy at school, um, I was in a maths class. Look at his face, go, where the hell is he going with this? <laughs> um, I was in a maths class, and I'm, I've always been very bad at maths, and um, it's one of the reasons I never became an astrophysicist, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I was sitting there going, oh God, what must be over? And then I thought the teacher was having a stroke, because halfway through, she, she wrote this sentence on the board, and I remember what it was, it said, my sunbeams are dancing in the meadow below, where daisies and tulips and daffodils grow. And then she did something weird and she wiped it off. I thought she's gone mad. She's gone raving mad. Anyway, then she turned around and said, now class, she said, now class, this is the accent there where I come from, it's from Burmese. Now class, can anybody tell me what I just wrote on the board? And I said, Miss, only hand up. Um, my son beat to dancing in the meadow below where daisies and tulips and uh, daffodils grow. And she said, very good, you've got the lead in the school play. 
And then my mum came to see it and she went, oh, I said, that was very good, darling. She said, come here. And she bought me a, a comic, Beano, called Beano, and a Mars bar, which is a dog bar. So I realised that acting was like a reward for a lack of attention and, and, and bad schoolwork. So I thought, well, that suits me right down to the ground. Funnily enough, the last play I did in 2017 was King Lear at the Globe Theatre in London. And I'd obviously told the story to someone because on the last night, the press office gave me a copy of the Beano and a Mars bar as my treat, which I think was really sweet. So, so out, out of curiosity, have you ever portrayed an astrophysicist in any of your... Uh, I did portray a physicist of kind in, a, in, a, in a, a wonderful TV film about the Challenger disaster uh, about 10 years ago. So I, I did get to play a scientist. Yeah. And I know I gushed about it before, but I'm, I have to mention how cool it is that you got to perform at the Globe. That is I know, it's so wonderful. Really thrilling, really thrilling. Yeah. I can't even imagine. No, well, I mean, it was, so, it was so thrilling, really, that I haven't gone to the stage since, because I think he played King Lear at the Globe, you know, a recreation of Shakespeare's own theatre. Um, it's going to have to be something pretty damn good to be, as, to be as enjoyable as that, you know. Very fair. All right, were there any other questions? Okay, there's one in the back, and then we'll come down to you. Go ahead. Okay, uh, the first one is, uh, how hard was it for you to come up with your voice for Pirates? And also, what was it like having Keith Richards on the set? Having to keep what? How hard Keith Richards. Richards on the set. Oh, God. <laughs> but also, how, coming up with the voice for your character, was that easy, or did you go through several different things? Well, no, I'll tell you exactly how I came up with the voice. <clears throat> Apart from the fact that the two, the, the, the pirate voice, the classic sort of pirate voice, is a mixture of two ports in England, Dublin and Bristol. I mean, Ireland in the Great, in, in the British Isles, uh, Dublin and Bristol. Well, my mum was from Bristol and had a very strong, very strong Dublin, um, Bristol accent, and my dad was Irish, was in D Dublin. So I sort of merged those two together, and they sort of came out like this, you know. So I thought that'll, that'll do me. Also, there was. Um, a very famous comedian in the 50s, a sort of a contemporary of um, uh, Sid Caesar, I suppose, our, our version of him, who used to do an impression of Robert Newton doing Long John Silver in Treasure Island in 1952. So I thought, well, if I did an impression of Tony Hancock doing an impression of Robert Newton with my mum and dad's accent, I might get somewhere, and I did. <laughs> and also working with Keith Richards, that was your oh, second? Yeah. My first vision of Keith Richards was I was walking past um, I was walking past a trailer and I heard the, ch the clink of uh, ice cubes in a glass and these two little skinny legs hanging out of the trailer. <laughs> and I thought that must be Keith Richards. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> he was funny. At one point, um, we were doing a scene, and he had this big hat on. And uh, he was, he, we just get him to sit down, maybe, but he was standing there, and uh, he, kept, he, kept, he was doing an offline for Johnny. And he's not very steady on his feet, Keith, believe it or not. And he kept leaning in front of the camera, and his hat would go in front of the lens, in front of Johnny. So the, direct, the director said to him, um, Keith, can, can you not lean to the right? Um, he said, because part of your hat's coming into the, um, into the frame. And Keith said, about how much of the hat is going into the frame? <laughs> and uh, the director said, well, well, about that much. And he said, well, chop that much off the hat. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly reasonable suggestion. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Right, you had a question, Dan? Uh, you've had a lot of roles, both on stage and in film and TV. Do you have something that you're proudest of? Who do you think is your best one? I always answer that question with, um, uh, I'm proudest of my next job, <laughs> and it will be my best work. Um, but no, I mean, obviously, Mr. Gibbs uh, changed my profile at the age of 46. Um, you know, I was a pretty successful actor in England, but doing those films brought me to this lovely country and to meet all of you lovely people and to work here and to work more internationally. So that, you know, that's a pretty, um, a pretty nice change to have at that time in your <coughs> life. There are many other roles I've enjoyed. I, 
Um, I, I have done a few recreations of older comedians in England. It's something I've sort of started to do more and more, actually, and I really like that. I really like that very strange thing of taking somebody else's performance and going, I've got to recreate that person and that performance that they gave to the satisfaction of people who remember, you know, that, that those, those old sitcoms or whatever they were, and remember them fondly and want to see. It's usually the tapes that have been lost. So we go, well, we'll try to recreate it for you, what it might have been like to see this episode that you can never see. All right, any final questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. hi there. No, of course there's a lunch. Yeah, yeah sure. I have a question for you, like, go to A and D. See, what you're forgetting is that you're the other side of a very large room and you've got a big hat on. Um, the other side of Phantom of the Opera. Is there any chance we can give yeah. him a mic? Yes, we can. Eeyore, if you can. And I've always wondered what Eeyore sounds like, yeah. and now we Come have. Come closer. Come closer, Eeyore. Alright. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's Unfortunately, the truth is revealed. <laughs> I wanted to ask, what was it like working with the light director, Joel Schumacher? It was great. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Very funny. Um, it, it, it was one of the funniest things he ever said to me, um, because he had quite a history of doing musicals, as, as you know, musical theater and stuff like that. And um, I was playing Joseph Bouquet, and at one point I was, I was singing the magical Lassu, and, I, and I, I had a couple of takes of it. And, and then I said, can, can, can we just do one more? And, and Joel said, uh, in a bit of, a, bit of a, a, an homage to Clint Eastwood, he said, uh, well, why, do you, why do you want to do that, Kevin? And I said, uh, because I'm, I'm worried I'm sounding too musical. He said, really don't worry about that. Thank you, we're moving on. <laughs> Uh, I, had, I had a little bit of an arrogant view of what my, how good my voice was with them. But it was sensational. And what a set. They built the entire theatre uh, in one big, long set. I mean, it wasn't lots of little sets. It, they built the entire opera house. And it was just magnificent. And I got to work with old friends like Kieran Hines and Miranda Richardson. It was terrific. It was Simon Callow, great people. And Gerard Butler. What? And Gerard Butler. Oh, Gerard Butler, yeah. Yeah, but I was talking about the great ones that I worked with. Big Lynch's singing was not very good. Thank you, New York. All right. Thank you, New York. We have about five minutes left. I know uh, you had a question. Go ahead. Uh, according to the internet, uh, you are going to play Roman Castabet in a movie coming up, Apartment 7 Yeah. So, can you talk about that at all, or is that no, I, I, can, I can talk about it here. Um, most of you aren't going to make it home, though, because it's, it's information that needs to be kept quiet. But um, I, again, this was about recreating another part because it was played by the great Sidney Blackman in the film Rosemary's Baby in 1966. So I saw it as an opportunity to... This is a prequel to Rosemary's Baby. There's a character early on in Rosemary's Baby that Mia Farrow meets uh, in the, in the, um, the washroom downstairs, she's called um, uh, Unfornia, Don Fornia, something, Don Fornia. Uh, Terry, Terry, Terry Don Fornia. Uh, Don Afrio, thank you. And um, very soon that character disappears in the film. So what they decided to do is they wanted to make the film of what the cast events tried to do with this girl and then had to move on to, to Rosemary. So it's a fascinating idea. Um, I got to work with playing my wife, the wonderful Diane Wiest, uh, two Oscar Award winning Diane Wiest, and playing uh, Terry um, Donofrio is the uh, absolutely um, amazing Julia Garner, who you may have seen in Ozark, and she is just sensational. So I have great uh, hopes for that. And wonderful, I've got Sidney Blackmer in the film, is so extraordinary. And when I finally got to the end and started going, God is dead, <laughs> Satan lives, the year is one. I was just, I, I thought, this is so exciting. <laughs> I mean, this film is great. If you just walked in, that's not what kind of panel this is. He's just reciting a line. Uh, apologies. Yeah. We welcome you. Come in. <laughs> All right, we have time for like one or two more questions. I saw a couple of their hands up. Go ahead. I had a question because you were talking about your book being a sci-fi comedy. Um, 
would you think it'd be worthy of a movie adaptation? And if it did, would you direct it? Well, um, very good question. Uh, the script is being worked on at the moment. And I am desperately trying to produce and direct a low budget uh, film, a uh, low budget science fiction film, so that I can convince myself to let me direct it when the, the book gets done. Uh, because, I, you know, you've got to have a bit of track record to draw. And I, and I don't want some idiot old bloke who's only directed a short film to direct my film, you know, so I want him to be a good director. So I'm going to try to. Do well, a you're feature already film. the perfect director for it. You did the book. You know what it's supposed to be. <laughs> I know that's true. <laughs> All right, you talk me into it. I'm going to do it. I can't believe I've come out of the job I didn't have when I walked in. Amazing. You're hired. It could be. Was there one final question over here? Okay. Oh, I tell you what I'm going to do though. Before then is I'm going to, and this is really hard because I've written, I realize I've written so many characters. I'm going to do the audio book of it. But I'm going to do it myself because when you do audio books, you usually do them in two afternoons. And my book's quite thick and it has thousands of characters in it and I simply can't do that. So I'm going to do it myself, sort of chapter by chapter over a couple of weeks. But as Clint Eastwood. But uh, yeah. So. Actually, Clint could be somebody in it, couldn't he? Yeah. yeah. All right, our final question. Go ahead. I know you're out of time, so uh, what answer is good. Uh, but your most challenging role that you had and the one that you were most excited going into when you had a project? Um, the most challenging ones have been were more when I was younger. And I would take a job because that's what you do. And then you'd realize there's really nothing to play here because I played so many nice young men when I was a kid and I hated every one of them. So those are the most challenging things. For me, a challenge like, you know, you've got to do lots of stunts or it's got to be out at sea. Those aren't challenges. Those are, those are like, oh, great. I can't believe I'm going to do this thing that I've never done before. I just was um, telling some of you guys about doing a Western. I did my first Western last year. It was terrific, you know. I'm so excited at the, at the age of you know, to be to be, uh, to be asked. To be, I must. I will tell you. I'm sure the people who I told. I can't remember. Who you, but they offered me the sheriff in a western in Montana, and I went, okay. First of all, um, I'm presuming if you're offering a man of my age the sheriff, he doesn't last very long. They said 17 minutes. <laughs> get shot. Um, and then I said, okay, uh, has he got a gun? Yeah. Has he got a hat? Yeah. Does he ride a horse? No, there's no horse riding scenes. I said, put in a scene where he rides a horse and I'll do the job. Because I'm not going back to England and saying, hey, I just played a cowboy. And they say, what's your horse like? I didn't have a horse. You weren't in a cowboy film. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to take the mickey out of me like that. You know? So I got to do it. It's just terrific. Anybody who buys my book gets, gets to see a picture of me as a cowboy, okay? Yeah, that's a deal for you. Yeah. Alright, well, uh, this has been such an honor. This has been so much fun. Any final thoughts? She says that because um, last time we were at a convention, I overslept and missed the panel. That's true. <laughs> but I... sat, she sat there on her own. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, but I still adore you, whether you show up or not. Much. I still think you're the greatest. Any final thoughts you want to leave us with here? Yes, uh, thank you, Knoxville, for having me. It's been really nice. I did my very first um, convention in Knoxville in 2011, so it's really, really nice to be back. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for coming back. Okay. Hi, this is Bonnie Gordon, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Make sure to like and subscribe before the self-destructs in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Just kidding. Have fun and follow your fandom.